Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, last night there was this war cabinet, the Brexit war cabinet, met, and all the reports we've got out are that far from the 20 billion that we were prepared to offer to leave the European Union that was conceded in Theresa May's speech back in Florence, apparently we're now prepared to pay, yeah, 40 billion. It's an eye-watering sum of money now. In their defence, the Brexiteers and the Cabinet, and David Davis spoke today in London, are saying that no specific monetary offer should be made uh, unless we know that the EU are going to give Britain a good deal. But I would argue that the pass has been sold, because actually what David Davis is saying, and clearly what Boris Johnson and Michael Gove have agreed to, is that if they got the right kind of trade deal, they would be prepared to pay a cool 40 billion for it. And this is a very long way. And bear in mind that Boris Johnson and Michael Gove did play big roles in that referendum and have played big roles in British politics since. This is a long way away from where they were just a few months ago. Here was Boris in the House of Commons in July. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, my honourable friend's words will have broken like a thunderclap over Brussels, and they will. Uh, they will pay. They will pay attention to what he has uh, has said, and he makes a he makes a very valid he makes a very valid point. And I think that uh, the sums that I have seen that they propose to uh, demand from this country seem to me to be extortionate. And I think to go whistle is, is an entirely appropriate expression. <laughs> so go whistle. Uh, and we talked, didn't we, last night a little bit about this when, you know, the last opinion polling showed that 63% of the country thought 20 billion was too much. Goodness knows what they'd say if you put the question of 40 billion to them. So I'm asking you, you know, we've got these two very powerful Brexiteers now in the Cabinet, and I'm asking you out there, particularly if you voted for Brexit, do you feel let down? by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. And if you do, call me on 0345 6060973. Maybe you think they had no option because they have to be loyal to the party and the leader. In which case, text to 84850. Or perhaps Remainers can tell me why paying 40 billion or perhaps more is good value. And you can tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And yes, I'm live from Liechtenstein and more of that in a moment. But first, I want to get the temperature of this because I think this government believes that provided it keeps saying we will fulfil Brexit, that they can pretty much get away with delaying it for a long time, filling us up with years of transition, paying a lot more money, conceding that the European Court of Justice, at least during the transition period, would have a say over the rights of EU citizens living in the United Kingdom. And I think this government think, oh, it'll be OK. The public will just put up with it. Well, I wonder, will they put up with it? I'm testing the temperature here. And my first caller is Philip in Livingston. Good evening, Philip. Good evening, Nigel. So, were you a Brexiteer, Philip? Uh, Nigel, I most certainly was. And how do you feel, you know, when you get these reports coming out last night that, you know, I mean, 20 billion, I mean, even that was never talked about, but when you get these reports that Johnson, Gove, Davis would agree to a truly huge sum of money, how do you feel about that? Well, it is appalling, but it all depends what they get back. Now, the BBC and others, Nigel, have been reporting today that they are going to offer more money in exchange for talks. Now, to my mind, that is nonsensical. You don't offer more money simply in exchange for talks. And what I would do, and you can imagine Thatcher doing this or Churchill doing this, is to get up and say, look, we will consider, without any commitment, we will consider more money only if you offer us an excellent trade deal. And then the British government will st stand by and consider uh, how we react to that and whether you have made a good enough offer. In other words, using, mirroring their own language to us, Nigel. We will consider yeah. whether they've made a good enough offer. And if they have, then we will certainly offer more. But if they haven't, we reserve the right to withdraw the offer and take it off the table. So what you're saying, Philip, really, is that we need to try somehow, 
and gain the upper hand in these negotiations. But that's a tough call, given where, where we are at the moment, isn't it? And, and, and we, you know, the old, I actually teach negotiation skills to companies. And we always say, as you know, Nigel, never donate, always exchange. And she has to get on the front foot and say, look, if you make us a decent trade offer, then we will consider doing this. But if you don't, we reserve the right to take it off the table. And I think also, if I may say this, we need to look at the, uh, the languages coming out of Brussels. Uh, you will be as appalled as I think many of your listeners are when you listen to the language. You know, when asked to exchange concessions, which is the normal practice of a negotiation, Donald sure. Tusk last week sneered, Nigel, at the English sense of humour. Meanwhile, Chancellor right. Henkel says Germany expected us to, and I quote, offer unconditional surrender to the <laughs> EU. Now, Nigel, the last time the Germans demanded unconditional surrender was at the Battle of the Bulge, to which the American General McCauley responded with a, with a four-letter word, nuts. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, the two in half, as you can imagine, would do precisely the same. But can well, you really uh, expect that from Theresa May? I doubt Philip, it. Ma Philip, Margaret Thatcher would not have blinked the way that she did in Florence. Of that I'm absolutely certain. And I think these negotiations would be on a completely different level. But Philip, let me just ask you quickly. Uh, I mean, firstly, if there was a free trade deal, would it be worth £40 billion? Pounds? Uh, certainly not. Uh, we you. look at what happened to Canada. They didn't have to pay anything like that no. to get a good deal. We look, at, And the fact is people forget that the United States has increased its uh, exports into the EU far more at a far quicker a rate than has uh, Great Britain. And it has done so, Nigel, on WTO. I know. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? You do wonder, listening to some of this conversation, how the rest of the world manages without being controlled by Mr Juncker. And finally, Philip, do you feel that Boris Johnson and Michael Gove in particular, because they're the two highest profile ones, do you feel a bit let down by them as they go along with concession after concession? Well, well, well yes, I do, uh, because they're not demanding back. Uh, I say again to you, Nigel, never yep, donate, yep. always exchange. And yep, at the moment, yep. we're donating a lot, we're getting nothing back. And when you see, you know, the, the, there's an old uh, maxim in body language, as you know, the body seldom lies. And when we see Theresa May constantly nodding, supinely, obsequiously, acquiescing. Or look at the way she nervously nods in front of our uh, European uh, adversaries. In, uh, can you imagine a third wow. or a church wow. responding wow. in such a way? Well, it is well it's even worse than that. Bad. It's even, it's worse than that because we found out, did we not, that she had her Florence speech cleared by Mr. Juncker's office. Who could believe it? Philip from Livingston, great call. And as he says, never donate, always exchange. Philip, who clearly knows something about negotiations. I wonder how Lawrence in Camden feels and whether he thinks Boris and Michael Gove are letting the side down a bit, or, or is it necessary for them to do this? Well, number one, uh, Mr Farage, I think you let everybody down by the fact that you got what you wanted for, what, 20-odd years, and then you jumped ship? You're the pipe to where? Up, my friend. The pipe Which pipe ship pipe. did I jump to, Lawrence? Uh, you, Which ship did I jump to? Saying, no, I said you jumped ship. I don't know where you jumped to, but you ran away. They could, they don't even pay the leader of the of the uh, uh, the Brexit party. Now it, they got to do it voluntarily. Uh, Lawrence, I, I don't know where you've been um, or whether you saw what I was trying to do last week about George Soros in the European Parliament in Strasbourg, uh, but I'm leading um, a growing, I'm pleased to say, group of Eurosceptics from right across Europe in Brussels and Strasbourg. I'm still fully engaged as an elected MEP. I haven't jumped anywhere. Really? 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 Yes, really. Lawrence, thanks ever so much. Um, I've got time for John in Formby. John, good evening. Uh, were you a Brexiteer, John? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, I certainly was. And um, do you think, do you think that Michael Gove and Boris Johnson are going along with too many concessions and letting us down, or is this the necessary business of collective cabinet government in a tight corner? The, 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 this uh, weakness is becoming contagious. Um, I thought it was bad enough when we appear to have a uh, divided cabinet between uh, Ramonas and Leavers, but, but now uh, they're, they're all weaklings, it seems to me. 
Right. Um, Gove and Johnson I would describe as kippers, not in the sense of supporting UKIP, but uh, kippers in the sense that uh, they're two-faced and have no backbone. Hmm. Well, that's fairly uh, strong words, John, that you're using there. I mean, I mean, you know, they both played an important role in that referendum, and there was Boris in July saying there's absolutely no way we're going to pay a big sum of money. What, why are they doing this, John? Because they're... Are you saying it's, are you saying it's fundamentally because they're weak? Yes, I, I think it is. Uh, I, I think Gove has shown himself up as a, a, a backstabber. And uh, Boris Johnson um, can be all over the place. He can say one thing one minute and change around uh, pretty uh, smartly afterwards. Uh, but uh, it must be a joy for uh, the EU uh, up against such feeble opposition. Well, and particularly at a time, and I did talk about this last night again, but at a time when, you know, Germany hasn't got a government and may not have one for months, uh, it, Italy's going Eurosceptic by the day, Spain's got the biggest constitutional crisis it's faced since its awful civil war back in the 1930s, the Austrian elections, the Czech elections are all heading Eurosceptic, the EU's absolutely got its problems, and yet we appear to be bowing down to every command. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, you talk about other uh, countries' problems, but I think we've got plenty uh, in, in our own country. Uh, we, we've got so many people trying to sabotage Brexit that, that we're just not united as a nation. Uh, and, and as they say, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, I'm afraid that's right. And I think they're rather taking... And I think, John, you know, my view is that they're rather taking us for granted. They think, oh, well, you know, given that Corbyn's rather given up on the Brexit thing and the Labour Party have rather given up, it'll be OK. The voters will stay with us. Well, I'm not so sure they're right. John from Formby, I thank you. And John, um, quite strong in his personal attack there on Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. Perhaps you think John was unfair. If you do, let me know. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Liechtenstein, and it's 7.15. As the amount of money the government is prepared to pay in return for a trade deal goes up and up and up, I'm asking you whether you think Boris Johnson and Michael Gove are rather letting us down, given their previous statements on this subject. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that I'm in Liechtenstein, and I, I'm quite a well-travelled person. I've been around a lot of Europe, but I've never been to Liechtenstein in my life. It's a very small little country. But I was here this afternoon doing a debate against Theo Weigel, the former German finance minister, and the man who is called the father of the euro. And as you can imagine, they got rather diametrically opposed views of where the European Union's going. Weigel thinks the euro will last for at least 400 years, and the United States of Europe will become one of the main global superpowers. I think it's all falling to pieces because people want to live in nation states. But interesting, isn't it? Here's Liechtenstein, population of about 35,000 people, it's a member of the European Economic Area, but it's not a member of the European Union. And of course, surrounding it is Switzerland, which is not a member of the European Union and is not even a member of the European Economic Area. It all goes to show that individual countries can find their own relationships with the European Union or indeed with the rest of the world, which means surely we haven't got to pay 40 billion, or promise to, to even begin a conversation. I hope not. I wonder what Rick in Mansfield thinks. Rick, good evening. Evening, Nigel. Great to speak to you. Good evening. So, so you know, are the, are, are, are the Brexiteers being let down a bit here? Being let down? We're, we're, being, we're being left out to dry. We're be, they're going to leave us totally rudderless. The people that stood up and argued, you know, we've... we've We've got to leave, we've got to leave, this reason, that reason. And then they're giving in at the first sign of any bit of bother. Do you, do you know what I mean? If, if it had been 1939, they'd have been stood at side of him waving that bit of paper, wouldn't they? Peace in our time. That, to, to me, that's what they are. They're appeasers. <laughs> the, the frightened stiff are standing up and, and saying, we're British, we can do this. We're, we're you know, we're a, we're a strong nation. We're not going to be pushed about. If there is money to pay, let's let's have a look. Let's get it costed properly. Let's have it properly looked at by by people in the know and see what's what's right and what's wrong. But it seems to me like they're letting Europe pick a figure out of here 
and and they'll say, right, you either pay this or we're not talk to you. And they said, oh, please, please, yeah. no, talk to us, we'll give you more, we'll give you more. Do you, do you know, I challenged, I challenged Barnier on this in the European Parliament. Where are you getting these sums from? Are you not simply plucking them out of the air? Uh, and today, they've offered us no proper evidence as to where they get these figures from. So, Rick, you think that you, you do think the Eurosceptics then are letting us down? Oh, one hundred percent, definitely. And, and, you know what? I'm, but, I'm not. I'm not sure that that Euro skeptic. If I'm honest with you, they, they may be, but I think they will put their own careers before hmm. their country every single time. Wow! And I mean, you, you've is... only got to look at the leader. I mean, M Mrs. May, she kept her a, a mouth nice and quiet while it were all kicking off, edging a bet. So she was thinking, well, if it goes this way or that way, I can slip in and be prime minister. And so if that's what they've got as an example, is it any wonder that the weak and lily-livered? Well, but yeah, but it's OK, Rick, from their perspective, because, you see, Brexiteers like you are going to vote for them at the next election anyway, aren't you? Do you know what the sad thing is, Nigel? You, you're right. Not me. Not me. You, I, I, I couldn't vote for them. In a, I mean, I'm a... <laughs> Just, you know, it might not sound like Brian, but I'm a Labour supporter, and I, I probably want to be out of Europe for different reasons to yourself. But I respect you, I respect your argument, your argument, an honest politician, which is, they're very far and few between. Uh, so I definitely wouldn't vote for him. But you're right, but how could, people will. But Rick, but Rick, how could you vote Labour when, you know, your leader, uh, you know, and I praised him the day he launched that manifesto, we're leaving the single market, we're ending free movement of people. I mean, they've given up even more than the Tory party. Yeah, they have. You're right. And I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm torn by it. I am a Labour voter. I'm a typical Labour voter, but it doesn't mean I'll vote Labour at next election. I'll no, tell you that. I mean, well. You know, if, if, it, if it were run by Dennis Skinner, I might be, it might be a bit different, because I think he'd have a different view on it. <laughs> well, Dennis Skinner, and there is a man of strong Eurosceptic views. Rick in Mansfield, thank you for your call. Thank you for your passion. I get on text. I do not agree with the extra cash to the EU, but we the people have no say in the matter. If the EU carry on with their ways, then we should pay them nothing and we should walk away, says Roger. They talk about 40 billion like it's peanuts. We voted to leave, not to be held to ransom. I can't believe the PM is letting them tell us what to do. These talks are one-sided. We don't need to give them all this money, says Shirley. Well, I tell you what, Shirley, is really pertinent about your point and saying 40 billion isn't peanuts. Because tomorrow, hey, it's the budget. So what happens? Philip Hammond stands up and announces... He announces some tax increases, maybe not particularly big tax increases, but whether it's on diesel cars or whatever it may be, he announces some tax increases. I'll tell you what the public will say. They'll say, we're paying our taxes, and we're paying more taxes just to pay Monsieur Barnier's huge Brexit bill. And I think this could land the government. If any taxation rises tomorrow in the face of what they're prepared to offer, I think it's going to cause them problems. As I say, they believe, the Conservative Party believe, that they, as long as they say they're the party of Brexit, it almost doesn't matter what they concede, because you're all going to go out, maybe our friend from uh, Mansfield wasn't, but in general, all of you on the Eurosceptic side are going to go out and vote for them at the next general election. And I'm not so sure they can take you for granted. I think, at the moment, I don't think the public is yet really angry but I certainly think it's very concerned. I wonder what Pat in Halton Regis has to say. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. Well, the Remainers are controlling Brexit at the moment in government, and then you've got the businesses trying to influence uh, Brexit um, to the government, and then you've got the EU who are controlling Brexit as well, and we've got our government who are not listening to us that voted for Brexit. And this £40 billion could have be well spent on increasing the numbers of police in our police force to stop rising crime, our schools, our hospitals, and if they think they're going to get away with putting £40 billion into the EU pockets, then the parliamentarians will be this country's enemy, and they really will. Pat, I have to say, I think you're right, and I, I sense that what you've just voiced there uh, is something that as the months and perhaps even year or two goes by, uh, will be a point of view held by literally millions of people. Are you normally, Pat, a Conservative voter or a Labour voter? 
Well, I've been a Conservative councillor, a Liberal Democrat councillor. I've been for all the parties, Nigel. I'm currently UKIP. <laughs> So okay. I actually move around the parties that actually represent the people. And if they stop representing those people, I shall move again. And I will move again. If there's a far-right party that comes up, I'm going to be like millions of other people. We're going to, act, excuse the pun, but we're going to have to stuff these parties that are in government at the moment because they do not listen to the people. And we know that now. No, Pat, I thank you for your call, and very much in line from that, um, I get from um, Phil in Carmarthen in Wales, uh, might I suggest that we have another referendum, and I think, oh no, please, not another one, on whether the people of the United Kingdom want to spend £40 billion on domestic services or give it to the EU. Oh, I like the sound of that. That's quite a good referendum. I think, the trouble is, I think we know what the result would be. Um, and whilst I like direct democracy, um, I'm not sure... Uh, that like Switzerland and Switzerland particularly, we should be going out to vote all that often on that many issues. I think people might just get bored. Uh, Michael is calling me from Manchester. Michael, good evening. G good evening, Nigel. Uh, thank you for having me. Well, not oh, at all. You, you, you're a new caller to the show, Michael. What? I mean, how strong? Yes. How, how strongly do you feel about this? Very strongly. And I tell you, Nigel, I was a Remainer, and yep. I say that completely honestly. I was a Remainer. And, but, you know, I'm a Democrat first and foremost. And yep. when this came through, I had a few days of despondency, but I thought, let's make the best of it. We can, there's a, there's a lot of goodwill out there. Let's make the best of it. We come together better than any other nation in the world. We will make it work. What a bloody mess. Excuse my language. Yeah, bit of, bit of that language, but, but, we'll, but we'll, we'll allow you once, Michael. But, yeah, but no, go on, please. What is she doing? It's like watching the cast of Some Mothers Do Have Them trying to negotiate it's absolutely <laughs> shameful. <laughs> Like that, I um, I saw a friend of mine last night, Michael, uh, briefly in London, and um, he was a, a strong lever. Uh, and, and, and he said to me, he said, I can't even I can't even listen to the news anymore. He said, I just find it too depressing. And there is this feeling, Michael, amongst many of us, that actually the prime minister is pitifully weak in all of this. I th do you know when 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 she came in and. The whole thing was happening. I thought, well, this is fine. It's going to be a tough road, but we will make it work. Th th this is turning into really sabotage on all sides because what's happening is no, what's going to end up happening, I fear, is no one's going to get what they want. I think, I mean, cons Nigel, consider the ineptitude of a government that renders the will of everyone voiceless. It's, it's completely, I've just never seen anything like it. Never. Do you, do you think, Michael, that if, if the Tory party came to their senses and realised this was going nowhere, and that actually every day they did the Jeremy Corbyn get stronger, do you think with a different leader it could change? Well, I'll tell you the danger, and I, 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 I tell you, I don't agree with Rhys Mogg on a lot of his social views, but I think he's much stronger, and I think he would see this country into a much stronger free market position post-Brexit. What I okay. fear is going to happen is that Theresa May, as, as a nicer woman as I'm sure she is, is going to lead us down this path of subservience. It's going to weaken the Tories from within. She's going to be deposed. There will be an election and Corbyn will take it. And well, can you I, imagine? No, listen, the longer I've said this before on this show, and I mean it, the longer she stays there, the more she actually upsets particularly those that really believe with all their hearts, the less she can take them for granted, and more, the more likely it is he becomes. I thank you very much indeed for your call. They are selling out. They need to grow a pair. They need to tell the EU we will pay them nothing. May needs to go. We need Bog, says Phil to the Nigel Farage Show, exclusive to BBC, live from Liechtenstein, it's 7.30. As the Brexit bill appears to go up from 20 to perhaps even 40 billion, I'm asking you, what on earth are Boris Johnson and Michael Gove doing and do you feel let down by them? But first, Ireland has a relatively new Prime Minister, or Taoiseach, as he's known in that country, Leo Varadkar. And he has been causing a bit of a stir over the course of the last week. In fact, the Sun newspaper's editorial at the weekend suggested that he shut his gob because he keeps saying all sorts of very strong things about Brexit that unless the British do X, Y and Z, he could potentially himself even veto the trade talks. But today, it's on the issue 
of the Irish border that he's been speaking. Uh, and he's really, really upset Arlene Foster, the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, and of course, you know, a key figure with whom Mrs May did the deal that allows her to be in power after that pretty ruinous election for her back on June the 8th. And Arlene Foster has accused him of being reckless as Brexit talks enter a critical phase. Uh, you see, the EU are hinting, or saying really, that Northern Ireland may need to stay in the customs union if there were to be no checks at the border. Uh, and Foster went even further in a criticism when she said that it was a very careless thing to say that a border coming back between the North and the South could jeopardise the peace process. And it's funny, isn't it, that up until now, it's only been the European Union suggesting there might be a problem with this border. I've argued we've had a common travel area with Ireland since 1921. We need no lessons from Monsieur Barnier or anybody else on this. And when it comes to goods and services move, moving back and forth across the border, well, frankly, the answer is simple. Let's have a simple free trade deal uh, between the two of us, and then there wouldn't be a problem. And yet, it looks to me like this Irish Prime Minister is frankly doing the bidding of his European lords and masters. Irish politicians in recent years have been very good at that. And I would say to you, uh, Mr Varadkar, uh, what about your farmers? What about your businesses for whom the UK is absolutely the key export market? Something like 50% of Irish beef comes to the United Kingdom. So rather than using this as a means, frankly, of trying to break up the United Kingdom, why don't you do the right thing by your own people and your own businesses, stop threatening us, and actually start to sort some common sense on trade? I suspect those words will be entirely wasted, but hey, you know what? I tried. So back to Boris, back to Michael Gove, back to do you feel, if, particularly if you're a Brexiteer, do you feel let down by them? Uh, because it appears that if we were to get, and David Davis couched this carefully today, but if we were to get the right trade deal, then we would be prepared to pay a Brexit bill, and it's rumoured, not confirmed, but rumoured, that could be, after the Brexit war cabinet last night, as much as £40 billion. I wonder what Omar in East Ham makes of all of this. Good evening, Omar. Uh, good evening, Nigel. Thank you for having Michael. Um, Nigel, Not a bit. We have to take a real good look at the UK team. Uh, we've just got politicians on the team. We don't have any professional negotiators. What we need to do is cut down the politicians, all right, until the rest of the places where we've got a negotiating team. Uh, so what I'm saying is let's say a couple of Brexiteers, one Remainer, maybe another politician who knows how the European Parliament works, and the rest should be filled with a negotiating team. We do nothing but negotiate. A skillful negotiate, professional negotiate. Negotiate. That's what we need. And then if we have... I wouldn't that, mind that, Omar. Well, then we'll get somewhere. I wouldn't mind that, Omar. But I do worry that given where we are in the negotiations now, where basically the Prime Minister blinks in Florence, starts to make starts to make concessions or perhaps some would say starts to appease how do we get it back from there i think the best thing to do is uh, i think the best thing to do is to go in with an offer and stick with it just go in with a different offer and stick with it and saying that the um 40 billion that we have just um, put in i mean the 40 billion um figure that we're playing around with at the moment uh, uh, I say just uh, take that off and then put in a different offer. Uh, I mean, I know okay. it's crazy. I know it sounds crazy, well, but the thing is this, is that we don't know what we're going to get for 40 billion. I know that these guys are well, saying that. Well, okay. well, Omar, Omar, we shouldn't offer a penny unless, we, unless we're going to get something back in exchange. And we had Philip on the show earlier who said he teaches negotiations. Do you know, you have to have an exchange of some kind. We cannot just make a blind offer, and I hope and pray that we don't make a blind offer. But Omar, let me ask you just one other question. You know, do you think in the minds of Brexit voters out there that Boris Johnson and Michael Gove are holding good faith with them? I feel a bit let down by them. I really do. I, I've expected more from them. I really yes. expected more from them. I didn't expect them to um, concede so easily. I mean, I, you see, the trouble is this. It's all politics. They're thinking politically. They're not thinking in terms of, um, what, in, in a business sense. 
No, well, I'm... Well, I think you're right, Omar. I think they're thinking about politics of the Conservative Party, of the Cabinet, of perhaps even keeping their own conditions. Omar, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Now, Graham has got some strong views on this, and he says, we need to show other countries in the EU that there is nothing to fear from escaping from this prison of European nations. We can only do this by standing up to our jailers and blackmailers. And Steve from Sutton has a very novel idea. He said, imagine you were divorcing the wife, and she says, until it's through, you can't talk to any other women. What would Boris or Gove have to say to that? I don't know, Steve from Sutton, but it's a novel idea. Joseph from Bedford is calling me. Another new caller to the show. Joseph, are these guys, and you know who they played a great role in the referendum, are they letting the side down? Uh, good evening, Mr. Farage. Um, no, I don't think they're letting the side down, really. Um, okay. Let me say a quick thing. I was never really a fan of your politics, but I'm a big fan of your show. So I think you find your calling in life, really, to do this, if I'm being honest with you. You've got new well, OK, well, 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 that's fine. And, Joseph, you know, the point about this show is, and, and, and the great thing with LBC, is we're allowed as presenters to have opinions, but you, the public, are allowed to come back and, 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 and knock them down, as long as it's plight, in any way you wish. And I sort of kind of think, well, really... Uh, what we're doing on these programmes here with this with this station is this is real democracy. It is, it is, and I really appreciate it. I've got no problem with that. I think, but what, the point I wanted to make was this: just yeah. two quick points. The first one is that you know when everyone keeps saying that we don't owe them a penny, I disagree with that. We entered into agreements, into commitments, and I completely take the point that you don't pay a blank invoice. That we should have a breakdown of what we owe. <laughs> From them and Mr. Barney, I don't know, Mr. Barney and whoever else, they're not given that, but they should. No. And I think the second Sorry. thing about you know what you said about should we be let down by them? Um, you know, Boris and Go. So, mm. that, well, realistically, in negotiations, that's how it works. One person goes in with an extraordinary high amount, the other person goes with an extraordinary low amount, and they meet in the middle. I think there's no way on earth that when they said the 20 billion figure, that's what they actually meant. That was just their negotiating position, and they've always anticipated to increase. So that's how negotiations work. Like you know, I'm sure, in working in this. I, well, I, well I, I, I do, Joseph, but, it, but it's a question of where negotiations start from and where they go to and what's acceptable and reasonable and what's not. And, and, and frankly, you know, when Boris made those comments back in July, I mean, if you'd said to me, Joseph, six months ago, the British government could pay as much as 20 billion as a leaving bill, I mean, I simply wouldn't have believed it because I would take the view that British public opinion wouldn't stand for it. And now I'm, be I'm, now I'm being told it could be as high as 40 billion. Uh, I, 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 Joseph, they, they may think in, in the war cabinet, the, the Brexit war cabinet, that if they get a free trade deal, 40 billion is acceptable. I'm not sure the country's going to wear it. That's really what I'm saying. Personally, what I'm saying, I don't think we should pay for a free trade deal. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think we should pay a penny for a free trade deal. What I think we should look at is what we owe due to the commitments that we enter ah. into. <laughs> OK. At least provide us with that. So I'm not trying to take their side to then they're behaving correctly. Fine, they fine, fine, fine. What we owe and we should pay that. That's that simple. Well, well, do you know what? I'm happy with that. I've said for months on this that there is an issue with 22,000 pensioners. I believe that we should take those pensioners off their books so that, so that, that long-term commitment disappears. And I've always said, Joseph, that we did enter into commitments, spending commitments, that go through uh, to the end of 2020, and we should honour that as well. And that's fine, but against that, we do need to net off what assets we've got. But I think, frankly, all, and I'm going to be with you on this, Joseph, 100%, all this talk about whether the figure's 10 or 50 or 100, unless we can see some itemisation, frankly, it's, it's all a bit like a sort of rather drunken game of poker. It's really very odd. Joseph and Bedford, I thank you very much for your call. You listen to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Liechtenstein, and it's 7.45. We appear to be prepared to pay ever more money if we can get a free trade deal, perhaps as much as 40 billion, mind you. Don't forget, when she offered 20 billion, uh, which is effectively what she did in the Florence speech, she was told that wasn't enough. And if she goes back and nudge and a wink, it's going to be 40 billion, Monsieur Barnier. Isn't that great? He'll say, oh, I really don't think, uh, to be honest, Prime Minister, you've gone as far as we would like. That's how I see this negotiation. But I've said to you, I think many Brexiteers are going to start feeling a bit let down by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. But I also strongly have this feeling that the Conservative Party think it doesn't matter our voters will stay with us anyway. They're not going to go to Labour because they turn their backs on Brexit as well. 
Very interesting, in line with that, Barry in Essex says to me, I wrote to my MP, Rebecca Harris, Castle Point, Essex, and told her that if the Conservatives keep us in the EU, or if MPs in general block Brexit, that I will never vote for a mainstream party ever again. And I will vote for any party that promises a true Brexit, whether it's far right or far left, I couldn't care less. That's what I told her. And, and, and Barry, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the Conservative-led government will keep us in the European Union, and they won't. We will leave the European Union in name. It's a question of whether, in reality, we're still tied up to nearly every single part of it and paying a fortune for that privilege. I wonder what Kumar in Ealing makes of all of this. Good evening. Yes, three very brief uh, points, I promise. First sure. of all, given that our net payment is 15 minus 10 billion, i.e. 5 billion uh, per annum, that means that we're going to be paying eight years worth of uh, contributions, which is a far. Second point is this, that 40 years ago, there were 15 workers in work to generate uh, taxes for every pensioner uh, as the baby boomers join the workforce. That 15 is down, down to three, the way in Germany it's two to one, which is why Merkel, who's no dodo, led in two million immigrants. But my question to you, sir, is this. Do, are we go, therefore going to reduce the, the benefits of the one or increase the tax to the three or try and get the three to five to seven? Most economists say, say that in, an, in a developed economy you need at least seven workers generate pensions for every pensioner. And my final question to you is thank, or rhetoric, and is thank God for that we don't have PR in this company. We have, because look at the mess in Germany through fringe parties, basically where you have the tail wagging the dog. Thank God we don't have that in this country. Well, we have well, generally... Well, in, Kumar, Kumar, you've really got it all off your chest there in that phone call, and I let you do it. Um, it's a really interesting point about Germany. Actually, what's happened is a Eurosceptic party has come in uh, scored exactly the same number of uh, uh, same percentage of votes that UKIP got in 2015, but for their trouble got 94 seats, and it's completely upset the political uh, apple cart. Um, uh, equally, uh, you could call that a criticism if you like of PR, um, but I could show you uh, some pretty strong criticisms of first past the post of people feeling helpless. That's a separate debate for another evening. Uh, you said our net contribution was five billion a year. I would say it's nearer eight to ten billion a year. But whichever way we cut it, whether it's eight years contributions or five years contributions, it is simply too much. And on that point, we agree. And when we debate Germany, Kumar, which we're going to in the next few days, because this is going to be a massive issue, a massive issue not just in Germany, but a massive issue in European politics. And as I predicted yesterday, at the next summit will be told, oh, well, I'm sorry. But Brexit's going to have to put on hold because the Germans haven't got a government. When we do uh, talk about Germany, please ring up um, and join us in that conversation. Emma is calling from Herm, Herm Hill. Emma, good evening. Hello, that's me. And um, I can't actually believe that I'm phoning you, uh, but there you go, I am, because you make me so angry, I normally switch you off. But tonight, <laughs> okay. I left you on. And I just want to say, I think that you are responsible for the absolute turmoil and mess that this country is in. There are so many things to deb debate, discuss, uh, that need 100% attention, and everything is taken over by Brexit. I hope well, well, that you're... Well, 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 there is, well, there is 40 billion here, Emma, isn't there? And Emma, by the way, I apologise to you. I shouldn't have done what I did. We should have let Mr Juncker and the unelected bureaucrats run our country, lose all traces of nationality, open our borders up to the world, probably get rid of the Union Jack as well, because it was a symbol of racism, and I'm really sorry for what I did. Thank you. Um, Rob is calling from Manchester. Rob, hello. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah I'm absolutely appalled with this £40 billion pound that... Um that Theresa May is prepared to pay the EU. I think it's absolutely disgusting. I voted to leave the EU, and I want, basically, I want a hard Brexit, or so-called hard Brexit. Yes, well, I mean, you didn't vote for a hard Brexit, Rob, because there was no hard Brexit or soft Brexit discussed in the campaign. This is an invention of the Remainers who effectively want to say, ah, let's go for a nice little soft Brexit because big business likes that. And that would mean, effectively, we'd finish up in the European economic area a bit like Norway or even here in Liechtenstein. No, you voted, for, you voted, Rob, for Brexit. But there could be an argument, Rob, that says maybe it is worth paying some money 
if it gets us out quickly and cleanly? Well, I mean, I, I, I just think that, quite honestly, there's the £40 billion really should be spent on other things such as a health service, um, roads, even paying off the national debt. I don't, I don't think we should be paying the EU a single penny. I think we should, personally, I think we should just walk away tomorrow morning, in my opinion. Yes. Well, the, um, it has to be said, um, it has to be said that um, Peter Bone is with you. Peter Bone, Tory MP for Wellingborough, says he wouldn't pay them more than a pound. All right, we all, I mean, now, now, now tell me, um, you know, would you normally vote Conservative in general elections or not? I did at the last one, but to be quite honest with you, I'm absolutely disgusted with them, but I'm, I'm probably more disgusted the fact that we don't have a credible opposition who can oppose this nonsense. Um, I, I think if there was an election tomorrow, I, I don't know who would vote to be truthful with you. I'd be tempted, much as I don't like saying it, if it gets us out, I'd be tempted to vote for either far left or far right, and I don't like saying yeah. that. I think it's that's a, a growing feeling. I think it's a growing feeling in the country. I thank you for your call. Uh, Dr. Ralph says, did the Irish people ask for Brexit? Your foolishness has no boundaries. Do you know what, Dr. Ralph? I remember being told this about the Euro. I was an idiot, cretin, moron. Of course we should join the Euro. Couldn't I see the amazing benefits that would come to our country? Couldn't I see that if we didn't join, foreign money would f not come into Britain? Businesses would leave. Goodness knows what would happen to house prices on the stock market. I've heard it all before. And it was wrong then. And it's wrong now. I tell you what, I tell you who has made the mistake. That's the Irish people being in the Euro. Given that nearly all of their overseas business is denominated in dollars or sterling, they are in the wrong currency. And I do believe that very, very strongly. Um, I'm going to go to David in Liverpool. David, good evening. Hi, Nigel. Look, you, look the world's unfair. You know that. They're, going in, they're, they're turning into gangsters in the, in the EU, you know, the heads and all that. That's like, <laughs> let's just give them the money, make a clean break. The, the, this, this country's booming, the unemployment's low, you know, and everything seems to be on the up. So make a clean break, get out, give them the cash. Nobody wants to give them the cash. Now, of course you don't, my God, but look, the, 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 that EU is run by money. There's nothing else going on, it's just money. And they're going to lose a big chunk. So they want it, so give them it, cut it, move on. Okay, no, David, well, you, I tell you, you put the case very clearly, but, of course... To hand over a sum of money, we do have to get a trade deal back, don't we? Oh, yeah, of course. No, that, that's what I'm saying. We get the deal. Yeah, Just yeah, give them yeah, the money, yeah, yeah. get the deal, yeah. move on. That's it. Like Fine. Uh, da David, um, and, and is there an upper limit on that money? <laughs> well, you know, they want 500 trillion, yeah, but, you know, look, I think <laughs> got a bit, but, you know, <laughs> if you're going to be serious gangsters like the cartel, you've got to say no and walk away. But it looks like we're getting there, Nigel, you know. And look, at the end of the day, if the country sails through, we get the deal and the fair trade and all this, we're happy, come on. All right, all right. No, no, you, it's a very pragmatic point of view. Um, and I might agree with that point of view if we were talking about five or ten billion. But I find if it's going to be 40 billion, I find that pretty much impossible. Nigel, we voted to leave, and that was a democratic win. We owe the EU nothing. I repeat, nothing. Offering 40 billion to these clowns just to agree to negotiate a trade deal with no guarantees, they might as well burn it, says Kevin. Well, Kevin, I totally agree with that. And it was interesting that David Davis today was really trying to distance himself from that position as much as he possibly could by saying, look, we would never hand over a very large sum of money unless we did get something back very concrete in return. Well, let's hope that's right. It had better be. Look, my views on this, uh, I, I, I do think this matters. Um, I've written a piece today for the Daily Telegraph that's just gone up on their, on their website. Now, uh, I, I think the more they dither and delay, uh, the more voters lose faith, not just in Brexit, not just in a democratic process, but I genuinely believe that if the Conservative Party think they can take millions of their Leave voters for granted, provided they keep saying they're going to do it, and people haven't, in their view, got anywhere else to go, I think they're in for a pretty big shock. I think, I th I think you could see abstentionism at the next election from Conservatives, particularly if they fight the next election saying, vote for us, we'll get you out. Who is going to believe them?
You've been listening to the Nigel Farage Show, live here from Liechtenstein. I'm back tomorrow evening from 7, coming up at 10 tonight. It's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clyde Bull. Nigel, thank you.